Perfect. All right. So I'll start again. We'd like to thank the Center for Ideas and Society, the Department of Media and Culture Studies, the Marketing Department at the UCR School of Business, Italian Studies, House and uh, House in the Department of Comparative Literature and Foreign Languages for co-sponsoring and helping us pull this um, event together rather quickly. Right? We idea um, came up with idea and pulled it together in about a month. Um, a special thanks goes to uh, Jan Wagner and Brandy Quarles Clark for the logistical behind the scenes uh, help in making today's event happen. And to Nicoletta, who's standing in the corner over there um, for being like, hey, let's invite Roberto after we heard that he was being invited to uh, Montclair State in New Jersey. So a little uh, bit about our speaker today. Uh, Robert has a bachelor's degree in education from Montclair State um, as a certified Italian and Spanish high school teacher. In 2020, Robert earned a master's in international business from the Cattolica University of Milan, where he delivered a research project on the economic impact of Italian sounding cheeses in the US. This project inspired him to start Stop Italian Sounding, a social media initiative with my, which my students have been interacting with uh, this week. So if your views go up, that's why. Um, um, which is a social media initiative recently turned LLC whose mission is to educate consumers about how to recognize real Italian products versus Italian sounding products through content marketing, storytelling education, and affiliated marketing. Um, for those of you who are joining us through Zoom, please make sure to type in, uh, either type in your name so that we can count your attendance um, or send a screenshot either to myself or Professor Nico um, so you can get uh, your extra credit. When it comes time for the Q&A, you can either type your questions in the chat um, and either one of us can field it or you can raise your hand and we will give you the mic, the proverbial mic, um, so you can read it yourself. Um, without further ado, let it, let's welcome our speaker, Robert Campana. Grazie mille, grazie. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you again to everybody um, for this uh, invitation. Uh, thank you, Irene. Thank you, Nicoletta. Uh, and thank you specifically to university for uh, for having me here tonight. Um, so I'm going to make this full screen. Um, all right. Uh, and just just so I know, are you able to see my my cursor on the screen? Yes. Okay. Because if I'm pointing to something, I say right here, so I know that you know where I'm looking at. Yes. Perfect. Great. Uh, so I'll start. Um, so I, I entitled this Italian or Italian sounding. Are you being duped? So. Um, first of all, a little bit of who I am. You, you, Irene did a very nice introduction. Again, I'm a high school teacher. I'm certified also, not just in Italian uh, at the high school la uh, level language, uh, at the high school level, um, but also in Spanish and teaching English as a foreign language. I am a dual citizen of the United States and Italy, um, meaning that I could, of course, vote in both countries, live in both countries and, and study there. Um, I do have a bachelor's from Montclair State and, and a master's in international business from the Uni Universidad Católica, and I am indeed the founder of Stop Italian Sounding. Um, Stop Italian Sounding is a movement that was actually born um, after my time at the Universidad Católica. There, I did a research project on the Italian sounding phenomenon in the United States with a specific focus on five Italian sounding cheeses and their economic impact um, in, in Italy that they have in Italy. And I came to the conclusion that those five cheeses that I analyzed, so mozzarella, ricotta, gorgonzola, pecorino, uh, and parmigiano, uh, were worth over 20 billion euros, just five cheeses. Uh, so I decided upon my return to the United States to open up an Instagram page just for fun. I was actually in a uh, uh, parking lot of a supermarket and I didn't want to go in having just returned from Italy of course um, so I, I actually made this in, this Instagram page on the, in, in the parking lot uh, for fun to educate and then it you know grew so on and so forth and then recently turned LLC uh, where I collaborate with some Italian food companies in order to uh, let's just say tell the story and history and tradition of those foods in comparison to the Italian sounding ones. Um, I would also like to mention that it is officially the uh, week of Italian cuisine in the world, 2023. Uh, tomorrow is the last day. So there were many initiatives around uh, not only the United States, but throughout Italy and other countries where Italian food and Italian food products are sold and appreciated. 
this was all organized, of course, by uh, uh, the Italian government. So I, I, I do want to uh, take a minute and, and at least mention that. So uh, I typically uh, like to start with a few examples and ask what do these products have in common? Um, and as we look at these products, we see that there are a lot of things that they share. Of course, they're all food products. Uh, we see uh, the green, white, and red, so the tricolor on some of them. For example, over here, we see the name Gorgonzola. We see the Italian flag. Of course, we also see the American flag right next to it. Uh, we see the tricolor over here on the pepperoni. I say it like that because there are two Ps, and the Italian word pepperoni only has one P. Uh, they're quite different. Um, we go back over here, we see the word San Marzano. So we see the use, of course, of the Italian language uh, and uh, the use of the, the food term of the very popular tomato. Again, we see another uh, example of Gorgonzola um, with in the background uh, or geographical reference. To me, it looks like the hills of Tuscany, which I find to be very interesting because Gorgonzola is not produced in Tuscany. It's produced in Piemonte and Lombardia, which are northern Italian regions. And then uh, right down here, we see Chianti, uh, which, of course, is the world famous wine from the region of Toscana. But underneath is California table wine. So <laughs> uh, kind of, uh, in my opinion, doesn't make too much sense because Chianti is a wine producing area within the region of, of Tuscany. So these are all products that share specific elements of, quote unquote, Italianness or Italianita in the Italian language. Um, because they're, they're trying to, of course, use, let's just say, Italy's, um, uh, Italy's a country, of course, a country known for high, high level uh, products, high level cuisine, so on and so forth. So they are using those elements in order to obviously sell their product. So uh, I just want to take a second and go over the official definition of uh, Italian sounding, because I did not make up the term Italian sounding. It actually comes from the Italian Ministry of Economic Development, so the Italian government. Uh, and according to them, it officially means the counterfeiting phenomenon that in the United States, but not only in the United States, targets Italian products in the food industry, even if they're protected by geographical indications, which we will talk about today, or designations of origin. Technically, it's a practice that does not damage the intellectual property right in the United States, but does induce the consumer through the use of words, colors, images, and geographical references, which we literally just saw on the previous slide, to erroneously associate the local product with the Italian one. Uh, so I have a few examples over here of Italian sounding products with the actual Italian product underneath. So if we start at the top left corner, we see again, the product San Marzano. And I decided to choose this product simply because San Marzano happens to be, of course, one of the most Im imitated Italian products in the world. Uh, also within the United States, it seems to be quite popular. So we have the Italian sounding form of San Marzano, one of many, I would say, with its actual version underneath. Uh, the real Italian San Marzano tomatoes will always have its full name, Pomodoro San Marzano dell'Agro Sarnese Nocerino DOP, D -O -P, which we will talk about. The next example I have over here is Parmesan, uh, which is the Italian sounding form of Parmigiano Reggiano, which happens to be the most imitated cheese in the world, not just in the United States. We see the real form of Parmigiano Reggiano right underneath with the rind, which happens to be dotted. Uh, that is actually protected by the Parmigiano Reggiano Consortium, not only in Italy, but also in other nations, the United States included. And then uh, another example we have is Asiago uh, from two producers right up here compared to, of course, its real form of Asiago right underneath. And we see, again, the rind branding. So the branding of rinds, of cheese rinds, if it's a harder cheese, uh, it tends to be the way to that Italian producers protect their actual cheese from fraud or from Italian sounding uh, products. So, of course, there is a huge economic value uh, to this entire phenomenon. And according to Coldiretti, Coldiretti is the leading Italian agricultural 
association, the biggest in Italy and actually the biggest in all of Europe. So according to Coldiretti, the Italian sounding phenomenon around the entire world is worth about 121 billion US dollars. Uh, I had to update that statistic a few months ago because it used to be only one, I say only, it used to be 100 billion US dollars and, and that continues to climb, uh, unfortunately. Um, so if we were to equate that to, let's just say, jobs, uh, that number would be at least 300,000, according to Coldiretti. Um, so people all, often ask me, of this 121 billion US dollars, is it possible to recuperate all of that uh, money? And the answer is no, that, that's, I, I don't think that that is a realistic thing, um, simply because, like I said, Italian sounding products are technically not illegal here in the United States and other countries in South America, for example, Italian sounding is illegal, but here in the U.S. it is not because, again, it does not damage the intellectual property of that specific product. Uh, I'm just going to go back uh, real quick and, and make another example. If we look at par Parmesan versus Parmigiano Reggiano, what I mean by intellectual property in this case is the fact that the real Parmigiano Reggiano has the dotted rind. If an Italian sounding producer, in this case Stella or any other ones, would dot their rind and make it look like this, then it would be illegal simply because Parmigiano Reggiano um, registered their name as a protected trademark here in the US. Okay, <clears throat> a few things we typically see when we, sh when we food shop. Um, are these three sayings, made in Italy, imported from Italy, and product of Italy. Now, sometimes these could cause quite a bit of confusion when, when you food shop, and I just wanted to clarify that for you. Um, so made in Italy is typically something we see a lot. It simply means that the product was fabricated in Italy. It is not certain that all the raw materials are actually sourced in Italy. So for example, uh, a producer could could get, I don't know, um, grain, let's just say, from another country, bring it to Italy, put it together in Italy, make, let's just say, pasta, and send it out and export it. And then they could put the stamp made in Italy. Imported from Italy uh, simply means that that product was sent from Italy to a foreign market. There's no indication as to uh, where the raw materials come from uh, or uh, any other indication uh about the know-how, for example, or the tradition or history. And finally, product of Italy uh, is the one specifically that we would look for if we're looking for an Italian product. Uh, that, and that simply means that all of the raw materials in that specific item are uh, actually Italian uh, from start to finish, so 100%. So geographic indications. This is something we see often when we purchase products. Um, we see this red and yellow logo. We see this blue and yellow logo. They're considered geographic indications. They're actually European Union logos. They're not specifically Italian. So it, it is possible to see these two logos on French products, on German products, on Spanish products, so on and so forth. Um, they are present only on food and beverage products that have a specific link to a certain territory. I'll give you a few examples after. Um, like I said, they are recognized in the European Union and in countries that have bilateral agreements. So I could think of an example uh, of a country that has a bilateral agreement with the European Union, and that's Canada with the CETA, the CETA agreement, Canadian European Trade Agreement, where certain European products are protected in Canada and certain Canadian products are protected in the European Union. So they have this agreement. Why did the European Union come up with this system? Uh, it's simply to protect the integrity and authenticity of the product. So basically from fraud, these logos do guarantee a certain level of traceability. That's one reason. And the second reason is to economically help to develop rural areas. So if we think of cheese producers who are in rural areas, um, these produce with this, this logo system, consortia were formed so groups were form were formed of let's just say if we take parmigiano reggiano as an example all small producers they form a group called a consortium and that consortium um, protects the product 
So uh, this was a system that that was able to economically help to develop uh, rural areas and let's just say uh, keep them uh, operating and not closing down. And like I mentioned before, not all, all products of Italy will have these logos. So it is possible to find a real Italian product that does not have this logo. Okay, so Denominazione di Origine Protetta, DOP, D-O-P. Perhaps one that you've seen purchasing Parmigiano Reggiano or purchasing Gorgonzola or, or many other uh, products. This simply means protected designation of origin. That is the English translation. Again, this is something that's translated in all the European Union languages. Uh, it is the highest level of protection according to the European Union with very strict regulations. Each product that has this logo is regulated, protected, and managed by a consortium. So uh, an EU product that has this simply means that the product has to be produced in a specific geographical location. And that's due to the tradition, the history, the environment, or microclimate territory, uh, and the know-how. So these four elements are protected. Um, and it's very important to, to mention environment, microclimate, territory, because um, they play an enormous role on the final product. If we think about cheese, for example, um, cows, they, they eat, you know, they, they graze in a certain location. Uh, they eat, they produce milk, and that milk has a specific taste based on what they eat. The feed comes from that specific territory. Uh, so the milk that is produced ultimately to make the cheese will have a specific taste. So um, the example I always go to is the famous Parmigiano Reggiano, uh, not only because it's perhaps one of Italy's most famous cheeses, uh, but also because it is the most uh, imitated cheese in the world. So the example we have over here, Parmigiano Reggiano, we see a few things. We see the first uh, thing over here is the logo. That is the official Parmigiano Reggiano Consortium logo. So all real Parmigiano Reggiano, if you buy it already pre-portioned, pre let's just say, will have that on there. Uh, and also it is a DOP product, meaning that it could only be produced in this small, tiny little location over here in Northern Italy, again, due to tradition, history, know-how, and environmental factors. Um, so if a producer, Outside of this area, let's just say in the south down here in Sicily, if they want to make Parmigiano Reggiano, it is totally illegal. Anything outside of this territory is illegal. And of course, to call it Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, within the European Union, the word Parmesan is specifically linked to Parmigiano Reggiano. The Parmigiano Reggiano Consortium uh, officially had it. Uh, was able to protect the word Parmesan, but that's only within the European Union. The word Parmesan is a direct translation to English of the word Parmigiano. Outside of the European Union, the word Parmesan is used. Um, however, it has no affiliation at all with the official Parmigiano Reggiano. Uh, another example or another two examples of DOP products, um, again, is a uh, Pomodoro San Marzano. And again, I have this up here specifically because it is a famous product here in the United States, but I want to show you on the map where specifically it is produced in a very tiny area. So first, on the left side, we have the consortium logo. So all of the producers of the San Marzano tomato, um, they are part of this group, this consortium. So the logo will be present. Uh, and these tomatoes are grown specifically in the region of Campania. Campania is a southern Italian region, um, but it's not the entire region in which these tomatoes are grown. Um, it is only this small area we see here in the red, which is around the Mount Vesuvius uh, area uh, of, um, of the Campania region. In fact, it is uh, specifically the soil that makes these uh, tomatoes taste the way they do. Uh, and that's why they could only be grown be grown there. If you were to take this seed and grow it somewhere else, technically they would taste a little different. Uh, if we take another uh, example right down here is Gorgonzola. Again, Gorgonzola is a DOP product. Gorgonzola could only be produced in the northern part of Italy, as we see highlighted in red, in the regions of Piemonte and Lombardia. Again, due to the reasons that we mentioned before, such as tradition, history, know-how, and uh, um, microclimate. 
Okay. Uh, I'd like to move on to the next uh, geographical indication, which is the Indicazione Geografica Protetta, EGP, or known as English as the Protected Geographic Indication, PGI. So we started with the red and yellow one, the DOP, that's the highest. The next one in line is this one, the PGI. Uh, again, a European Union logo. Uh, it is a, each product is, of course is regulated that has this, this logo protected and managed by a specific consortium. Uh, and a European Union product that has this logo means that at least one stage of production has to take place in the designated geographical area. Um, this is different compared to the previous logo that we just saw because the previous one, the DOP logo, uh, indicates that all stages of production have to take place in the specific area. Whereas this one, at least one stage. That means that the raw materials of this product or of a product with a PGI logo could come from outside of the designated area. No, no. Uh, for example, we have a few examples over here. There are many, many of them. I just chose a, a few. Um, the first one we have is a Chocolato di Modica. So chocolate from the city of Modica in Sicily. Um, this is a, a product that has the, uh, the PGI logo. Uh, meaning that some of the raw materials, in this case, cacao, comes from outside of the area of Modica in Sicily. Cacao, as we know, comes from South America. Uh, so for that reason, this product cannot be declared a, a DOP product, um, even though most of the, the phases of production, if not all the phases of production, are done within the city of Modica. Um, very similar, the next product, um, we have the Spec Alto Adice, EGP comes from Sud Tirol, which is the, um, it's the northern part of Italy, um, a German-speaking part of Italy. The meat for this speck uh, comes from outside of the area of Sud Tirol, or Alto Adice, as it's said in Italian. And then finally, the third example I have is Mortadella, which is a very popular uh, cured meat, or I should say cooked meat, um, not just in Italy, but around the world. Uh, and again, uh, the same thing goes for this. The raw materials used within the product Mortadella are allowed to come from outside of uh, the city of Bologna or the area of Bologna. And these are just a few. There are many other ones. Um, an interesting fact is that Italy is the country in Europe that has the most protected products. We're talking about PDO products. We're talking about these PGI products that we, we just went over. Um, so Italy does indeed have the, the most amount and that list keeps growing. I don't have a specific, specific number off the top of my head, um, but it, it does keep growing. Um, so it's kind of, kind of fun to, to try and keep up with because as we know, Italy is a country of, of many different traditions, many different um, uh, types of histories and different cuisines, I would venture to say from one region to another. So uh, everybody's always trying to, let's just say, get their, their specific product protected and recognized and, and, and valued. So uh, a few numbers I'd like to talk about because uh, there always is an economic side to things. Italy exports about 60 billion uh, euros worth of food and beverage products. It's a pretty big, big number. Um, believe it or not, it is, Italy is not the country that exports the most in Europe. Uh, that country is Germany. Uh, simply not because maybe they have better products or worse products. That's, of course, uh, up to your opinion. Um, but simply because Germany has better um, channels for distribution, whereas Italy, let's just say, is lacking a little in that in that area. So Italy only exports 60 billion euros. Uh, and that is compared to the 121 billion euros of Italian sounding products around the world. So we're, we're talking about about double um, the worth of Italian sounding products compared to that of real Italian products around the world. If you go to a supermarket, uh, statistics say here in the United States that about two out of every three, let's just say Italian labeled products are not Italian at all. They're Italian sounding. Um, so that's why it's very important, of course, to read the, the fine print. And uh, over here, this bottom image I have is an image that was taken by Coldiretti, again, the, the biggest association, agricultural association in Europe. 
And uh, they, of course, uh, found a lot of Italian selling products when, you know, when they come sometimes to the United States, there are events such as the summer fancy food event where a bunch of countries around the world, uh, they have stands, you know, trying to, to sell their food products. Italy is always centrally located and Coldiretti is always centrally located within the Italian pavilion. And they always have a section dedicated to Italian sounding products, as we see right down here. So uh, the question is, do Italian sounding products exist in other nations? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, North America, we're kind of limited with the countries we have. Uh, we have the United States, Canada and Mexico. Um, the United States tends to be of the three, the, the, the leading, let's just say, culprit of, of this, uh, followed by Canada and then Mexico in that specific order. The fact that the United States does produce Italian sounding products um, doesn't mean that those products are only sold in the United States. In fact, Italian sounding products that are made here are actually exported as well to other nations around the world. So for example, if we, we think of, I don't know, Italian sounding Parmesan, it's not just sold here in the United States, but also exported to Mexico, exported to places in Asia. And uh, that is because Italy as a country is, is not big enough, does not have the capacity to, to fulfill the demand of the entire world. Italy is a very small country compared to uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the countries around the world. South America, uh, we have mainly Argentina and Brazil, which are the two countries that, that produce uh, most of the Italian selling products. Of course, Italian selling products do exist in other South American countries, let's just say, uh, such as Peru or Colombia. Uh, however, in certain countries around South America, Italian selling is illegal. So there are legal actions uh, uh, towards those products. Europe, we have Russia, Poland, Germany, and the uh, United Kingdom, which tend to be the countries that imitate most Italian uh, products. Um, we have countries like Poland and Germany, which are two nations within the European Union. So it is a lot easier, let's just say, to um, get those products renamed or get those products removed, if you will. Uh, if Italy were to take legal actions, it's much easier uh, compared to that of Russia and the UK, which are two countries outside of the European Union. So it's a little more difficult. And then of course we have Asia. Uh, China tends to be the biggest culprit in Asia uh, of Italian selling products. Um, other countries in Asia such as Japan or South Korea don't really imitate a lot of Italian products. I'll talk about Japan for a second. The reason why Japan doesn't really imitate Italian, uh, Italian products is because Japan itself has a, a let's just say centuries old cuisine and it's kind of ingrained in their culture very similar to that of the Italian culture to respect the cuisine so they have that certain level of respect that's the first thing the second thing is um, they have in recent times they've been let's just say particularly fond of Italian products real Italian products so um, wine imports are on the on the rise cheese imports are on the rise in Japan so that they, they have that that specific desire for real Italian products. So Japan is not on the list of, uh, of these, these nations that imitate. And here are a few examples, concrete examples of Italian sounding products around the world. The first one on the top left, we have queijo parmesão. So I, I don't speak Portuguese, I try. Um, we see again, the elements such as uh, the green, white, and red, the tricolor. We see in this case, a big wheel of cheese, looks like parmigiano reggiano it's not we don't see the dotted rind um, but it's a big giant cheese and we see the word parmesan which looks like or sounds like i should say parmigiano uh next example we have over here is prosciutto uh we see at the top the logo this is san daniele uh and even though it does not specifically um well it does have the green white and red i'm noticing right now but it doesn't specifically have a big flag on it let's just say it does use the word san daniele and San Daniele is a type of prosciutto in Italy. It's called prosciutto di San Daniele. Uh, so that could cause a lot of confusion. I know this is a brand that is quite popular in Canada. Next over here from Germany, we have uh, Cresecco, which is imitating the, uh, pro, our, the, the Italian Prosecco. It's very similar. And in fact, it is not allowed 
Um, we see that Coldiretti was the first one to flag this product. And at the bottom left, we have a bag of cheese with green, white, and red on the front that says fresh buffalo mozzarella, 100% buffalo milk production, authentic Italian craftsmanship, we say at the bottom, um, and that is imitated from, uh, from China. So these are just a few examples of many, many examples uh, around the world of Italian sounding products. Again, the elements that we discussed before, geographical location, colors, use of Italian words are all present on the on the uh, the packaging. Uh, in terms of legal action, uh, the Crescecco from Germany was the only one that's not really allowed because Germany is part of the European Union. So there are more strict uh, um, rules um, in order to get that uh, removed or, or called something different. Um, Canada, uh, again, we did say that there is the, uh, the bilateral agreement between the European Union and, and Canada. Uh, however, San Daniele, let's just say, this brand within Canada has been around for so long uh, that it's been kind of, let's just say, grandfathered in. So, so uh, that, that stays. Um, if we, we look at the example over here from Brazil, uh, Queijo Parmesão, um, there are not many uh, rules or bilateral, there's not a bilateral agreement between the European Union and, and Brazil, so that is allowed. And, and Brazil also is the country that has the most um, descendants of Italians, so uh, we could say that that's also a reason why uh, these products exist. Uh, and then China, um, of course, uh, like I said, they, they do produce a lot of uh, imitated Italian products. Um, however, I do know that the European Union and China are work, working towards some sort of bilateral bilateral agreement where PDO and PGI European products would be protected in China uh, and Chinese products would be protected within the European Union. Uh, so that could be a step in the right direction. So uh, I just have uh, uh, two slides over here about uh, Italian American cuisine because as I talk about Italian sounding products uh, that are present here in the United States, one of the reasons is because of the large Italian uh, community, or I should say Italian descendant community, Italian American community. Um, as we know, uh, Italians after World War I, World War II, uh, emigrated to the United States and didn't just bring their, um, you know, their language or their, their culture, they brought their love for food as well. Um, and uh, certain Italian American dishes were born. Uh, and I'm always one to say that Italian cuisine and Italian American cuisine are similar, but they are different, both to be respected, both delicious in my opinion, um, but they're two, two different stories to tell, of course. And the main story over here uh, that I wanted to point out tonight is uh, spaghetti and meatballs. As we see on the left side, the Italian American dish. And uh, it's, it's a quite simple story uh, because Back in the 19th century, when, of course, we had the Italian immigrants arrive to the United States, they brought their love for, for pasta, for spaghetti. And since they found many riches here in the United States, they made money. They noticed that meat was in an abundance. So they decided to make their uh, uh, their, their meatballs a little bigger. Uh, the, let's just say, equivalent dish of this uh, within Italy, I believe in Abruzzo, so a central Italian region, would be the spaghetti alla chitarra con le palottine. So we see on the right side over here, the equivalent dish, the original one, if you will, uh, of spaghetti, which is actually made on guitar strings. It's pretty cool uh, with smaller meatballs on top. OK, so uh, spaghetti and meatballs, let's just say, does derive from that. It is indeed an Italian-American uh, dish. Uh, and then the next one I wanted to talk about uh, is this right over here. This dish is called uh, fettuccine alfredo. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to kind of call it a hybrid between Italian and Italian American um, because it actually was born in Italy, it was born in Rome uh, in the early 20th century. So Alfredo was the chef in this restaurant, um, which actually still exists till this day in Rome. And he was making this dish with fettuccine, butter and parmigian reggiano to give to his wife, who is, who is not feeling well. Um, and, uh, and he created this dish. He didn't call it Alfredo. He just simply called it fettuccine con burro e parmigiano reggiano. So fettuccine with butter and parmigiano reggiano. It wasn't until uh, Hollywood decided to show up in Rome um, 
and uh, try this dish. They brought their love for this dish back to the United States. And that's how the name was born, Fettuccine Alfredo, because Alfredo was a chef in Rome uh, and in Hollywood, as they brought this this dish back, this recipe back to the United States, decided to, to call it after after the original chef. So uh, this dish in Italy is not really known as Fettuccine Alfredo, but Fettuccine con burro e parmigiano reggiano. Okay, um, so my mission, let's just say with Stop Italian Sounding, uh, is to, of course, create awareness about real Italian sounding and Italian food products, um, to tell the story of, of, of both, specifically of Italian products, to tell the history, to teach the know-how, um, and, and to have fun with it. Because for me specifically, it's a passion to talk about Italian food. Um, and my vision, uh, is, so my long-term goal with this is to create some sort of consortium of authentic Italian food and beverage companies, import-export companies, and government agencies from the United States and Italy in order to protect against Italian selling products. So um, a question that I often get is if I am totally against the production of Italian sounding products here in the United States. And my answer is no, I am not against that. I do not intend, nor do I want to shut down entire industries uh, at all. Um, what I advocate for simply is for, let's just say, transparency on uh, food labels, on, on, you know, on boxes of pasta or sauces or, or salami or so on and so forth. Transparency is, all, is really all I ask for. Um, so why does spreading awareness even matter? In my opinion, it matters because most Italian selling products are imitations of protected Italian products. And from the Italian point of view, this is damaging um, not only to the economy, but to the image of Italy. Um, an example that I could come up with uh, is, let's just say, uh, if somebody here in the United States is used to consuming um, let's just say an Italian selling Parmesan. Um, then they go to Italy, they try the real one. They say, that's not what it's supposed to taste like. It's supposed to taste like what I'm used to back at home. So it kind of creates a false um, image of, of Italian cuisine. Uh, what point of view do I take when specifically determining uh, an Italian selling product? Um, I have to take the Italian point of view um, because most of these products are typically used in you know, the colors, names, words, geographical references, and they're trying to, to claim that they are something that they fundamentally, fundamentally are not. Um, so again, I do take the Italian point of view when judging this. Is this cultural appropriation? Uh, I would say Italian selling products could be a form of cultural appropriation. Uh, I say could be because um, it depends really how you, how you look specifically at it. Uh, again, I mentioned that the reason why a lot of Italian selling products do exist is because of the Italian American community, or I should say the Italian immigrants that came over. So they did bring their own culture, but then it evolved, let's just say, into um, a sort of cultural appropriation simply because there are elements of a non-dominant culture, in this case, Italian, uh, that is not uh, really respected in their original way. <clears throat> Uh, and am I, am I against the production of Italian style products in the United States? I'm not. As I said a few minutes ago, I am not against the production of it. I'm just for more transparency. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your attention. Grazie della vostra attenzione. Um, if you have any questions, you could feel free to reach out to me. Uh, at my email, robertcampana at stopitasounding.com. Over here, there's also a QR code. If you scan it, you'll go right to my website. Uh, on my website, which is still, let's just say, under construction, uh, every once in a while, I write blog articles. I do have most of my videos uploaded onto that website. I have a section called Learn, where you could learn about how to recognize real Italian products. Um, so it's, it's, let's just say, a, a work in progress. I want it to be a nice hub of, of information. I want, I want people to use it to learn. And of course, my Instagram and TikTok page, Stop Italian Sounding on both. Uh, it's a great, great way to reach me. I respond to all messages. It may take me a day or two, but I do respond to them. Um, and uh, I like to keep dialogue alive on, uh, on those social media platforms.
So I thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer questions and, uh, and, and speak with everyone. Thank you. Let's give Robert a round of applause. Thank you. So, thank you very um, much. I would like uh, to open up the floor for any questions that you might have or folks in my class who um, were asked to go through uh, Robert's social media and pick videos. Um, any questions or any comments that you have for him? Yeah, Alshani, go for it. Hold on. I'm <laughs> So I came in a little late and I just want to know sure. what is Italian sounding? Okay, so Italian sounding is a term that's used to indicate the phenomenon of um, a, a product outside of Italy, a food, food and beverage product that has elements such as uh, Italian colors, geographic references, um, uh, Italian words uh, that are written on the packaging of that product in order to... Um, uh, let's just say, induce the consumer to erroneously associate that product with the Italian one. So to put it in simple terms, it's it's a fake Italian food and beverage product. Hi. Um, so I was just kind of wondering, like, like you... I'm not necessarily like campaign the stop Italian sounding, but like, do you have future hopes of, you know, making some sort of change or like, like obviously you're growing your audience. Like, do you hope that like your viewers will, you know, take what you're saying and preaching and like, I don't know, kind of apply it when, you know, they're at the grocery store or something like that. Yeah. I would say that's my main hope is that they're more aware when they, when they shop is that they look twice at the, at the fine print. Of course, it's up to the consumer to purchase what he or she wants in the end. I um, also for a happy consumer, of course. Um, but my hope, yes, yeah, specifically is when they go to the, the to the supermarket, they're looking at the fine print. They say, "Oh, I thought this was Italian. I really wanted it. I'm, you know, I'm going to look again." Um, I, of course, do not advocate for shutting down industries of Italian selling products, but you know, just to be a little more aware. Uh, and this this problem is is very present with Italian cheeses and also olive oil as well, extra virgin olive oil. So it's it's a pretty big problem. Before I give you the mic, Maria Jose, I have a follow up question for that. So, what yeah. kind of guidance? It's Irene, by the way. What kind of guidance okay. would you give companies like Belgioioso, Ostella, or Galbani, or Volpi, um, that do have their Italian roots here, whether it be in the Midwest, New York, Missouri, whatever, it, going forward in their marketing and their label processes? I think it's more simple than one would think. Um, I would say two words, Italian style. I, I mean, if, if you put Italian style on, on the labeling, I think it's, it's, it's clear to a certain extent. Um, and also, you know, to put where the products actually come from in, in pretty big print so people could see. Um, another thing that I've always, it's an idea that I've, I've always floated around is if these companies are making, let's just say Parmesan or any other Italian sounding cheese, why don't they call it something else and really develop their area? Um, for example, instead of calling it Parmesan made in Wisconsin, and put an Italian flag when nothing inside that cheese is actually Italian. Why don't we call it with a different name and actually compete with Parmigiano Reggiano instead of imitate? So I guess another um, uh, opinion I have is, is, you know, change the name and, 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 and compete specifically with it because that's what happened throughout history within Europe. If we think of cheeses like, um, Gorgonzola, which is a specific blue cheese. And then we think of the French cheese Roquefort, which is very similar to Gorgonzola. The French cheese Roquefort is not called French Gorgonzola. It's called Roquefort. It's something different. Um, and they indeed do compete with each other. Thank you. Thank you for this one. All right. Um, so my question is, as in like the labeling for the DOP or the PDO, they're made within yes. that specific region, right? So like the Pamergiano Reggiano. Yes. Um, so what if the other parts of Italy want to make that cheese? Can they not? 
it is illegal. They're not allowed to. So um, there are many products within Italy that have a specific, uh, that specific protection, the PDO or the DOP protection. Uh, and that's because it's linked, historically speaking, to that territory. So Parmigiano Reggiano has a history within that small geographic area. Um, but it's not just a matter of history or tradition. It's also a matter of know-how. So how to make that product. But it goes farther than that as well, because we're talking about the raw materials that only come from that area, which in the end produce that product. Uh, if you take cheese, or I'm sorry, if you take milk from cows that graze, let's just say in Southern Italy, the product's going to taste different after. Because Italy is a country that's, that's made of many different microclimates, um, which has, has an effect on the, the final product. To follow up on Maria Jose's question, if you think specifically, instead of Parmigiano, Reggiano, mm -hmm. if you think of Pecorino, Pecorino is then, um, has an adjective that follows that represents the area that it's from. So there's the Pecorino Romano, which comes from Rome, Pecorino Sardo, Pecorino Toscano. So there's an indication of where the milk comes from. Exactly. That is correct. Yes. Any other questions? Hi. Um, so does that mean that the PDO products are difficult to come by, especially here in America, if they're only made in a small region in Italy? Um, I wouldn't say difficult. Of course, not all PDO products are exported from Italy to other countries. Um, I would say, based on my experience, it's quite easy, at least where I'm located, geographically speaking, here in New Jersey, to find PDO products especially the big ones like Parmigiano, Reggiano, or Pecorino Romano, um, or Prosciutto di Parma. Um, so the bigger ones are, are, you know, easily found here in the United States. Not all of them uh, for various reasons. Um, the reason could be maybe the production is so small. Um, so to your point, that would be one reason why you can't find it. But generally speaking, you could find them. And I guess I think our closest resource for for Italian original, like authentic Italian products. Any other? What questions? is your? I'm so, sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. You, oh, I said Italy is our closest resource oh. for. Oh, you'll be able to find them all over Italy. Yeah. So that's. <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard to find things. Um, even Italian sounding products are hard to find here in the Inland Empire, and if we do find them, they're very, very, very expensive. Oh, oh even the Italian sounding ones. Even, yeah, so like a small container of Belgioso Mascarpone, you're, I'm looking at the screen instead of you, costs like $6 for four ounces. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It's wow. Dumb. Well, high, <laughs> high demand and low supply. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Questions, comments, anything? Questions, comments. Nicoletta, do you have anything to ask? She says, thank you for making me hungry. Okay. Well, your, your dinner time's coming up by you guys. So uh, <laughs> maybe you could make a nice carbonara. <laughs> Even online. anybody online? Yeah, right. Uh, do we have any questions online? I'm not, I can't see if there's a hand up or anything. Online folks, no questions? Nope, nobody? All right. Well, if you think of any questions, again, you have my contact information i reply yeah. as soon as humanly possible um so even if you have any ideas for content for videos um you know other talks i'm, I'm always willing to do talks um it, again this is something i could talk about for hours and hours i do have so, a, a little bit of a question for you so i had my food class interact a lot with your videos and okay. post um ones that they found particularly striking or interesting and tell me why and one person who I think she left already um, talked about the food police. So if oh, you want to give us police. a little bit of insight on the food police, because she said that she'd never heard of them, but she thinks that every country should have them. And I think I yes. might agree with her. I, I do agree with her. Uh, so yes, Italy has the quote unquote food police. Um, so they are the carabinieri, a certain branch of the carabinieri. Uh, the carabinieri are it, Italy's like, very similar to like our National Guard, if you will. Um, but anyway, this branch of the Carabinieri, they go around and make sure that that um, the 
PDO products, PGI products are following the specific regulation that there's no fraud. Um, sometimes they find fraud in olive oil. They find fraud in, you know, prosciutto di parma that, you know, things are being imported from abroad and being labeled as prosciutto di parma. So that's specifically what I mean by the food police. Uh, unfortunately, it does not mean that if somebody's putting pineapple on pizza, they're going to be arrested. Um, <laughs> we haven't gotten to that level. I darn, I know. <laughs> Um, but it simply means that the food laws in Italy are being strictly enforced. Italy is, is a country that has very strict food laws across the board, um, which I particularly uh, am, am happy about. And I wish more countries would follow that. In fact, I, I believe that Italy is the, the, the world leader uh, in that specific, um, uh, in that realm of things. So those are the kind of part in, you know, do the food police ever go to the tourist traps and tell them that they're not making their food right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know, putting chicken on carbonara or something. I wish they would. They, they should start doing that. Maybe I guess if we raise our voice enough, they would start doing that. <laughs> Got to campaign everyone. I, I, I did hear, um, I don't know how true this is. I have to confirm it, that bad gelato in Italy is illegal in the sense where bad ingredients used to make gelato will no longer be allowed like bad for your health. Um, but that's something that I still have to uh, to dig into to make sure that it's actually true. Other questions? Well, thank you again, Robert, for your time and this fascinating yes, no uh, presentation. And for all of the videos that you post on social media, I definitely used a couple in my class this week. So I do appreciate that. Um, thank so let's you. give a round of applause to our speaker. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. If you need anything, uh, sempre a disposizione. Perfect. And I'm yes, please available. Um, take a look at his website. I know that he is in the process of establishing um, some food tours. Um, hopefully that Sicily uh, Terra Olio d'Oliva will be a thing that you know you can make happen. I, can I would love I would love to make, believe me, I have already I already asked that question. I would love to make that happen. And, and you're not the first to, to say that. Uh, so if that becomes a reality, I will definitely blast that out to everybody. You'll be the first to know. And hopefully the first one to sign up. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you again. And thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Okay.